We have a very large number of questions, but I do want exceptionally to uh, take the privilege of sitting here with you to ask one question myself. I happen to be part of a group called the European Leadership Network, which has Russian participants, uh, European and American participants, and which put out recently a study about the kinds of close military encounters that have happened uh, recently in uh, the European airspace and elsewhere. My question to you is this, uh, Sergei. Uh, if it is our first priority to try to find a way to uh, calm down the situation in eastern Ukraine uh, to obtain a ceasefire, uh, should it not be one of our next priorities to try to figure out a way to create an arrangement given the complete breakdown of mutual trust to create an arrangement that would at least enable all of us, Russia, NATO, the United States, European countries, to avoid avoidable, unnecessary, uh, potentially dangerous close military encounters. I think this is the last thing we need in this situation. So why can't we stick our heads together and create an arrangement that will make sure that our airplanes, our ships, uh, our military installations don't come as close to each other as has happened in recent weeks too often. Uh, and, and if I just may uh, invite Edward Lucas, uh, to add his question, because I think his question goes exactly in the, right, uh, in the same direction, if I'm not totally mistaken. Edward, he's over there. Mr. Minister, um, a few weeks ago, um, a plane leaving Copenhagen Airport on its way to Warsaw came within nine seconds of collision with one of your country's warplanes, which was flying in civilian airspace, in international airspace, with its transponders switched off. This is not something that any NATO or any EU country would do when flying near Russia. So why do your warplanes, your country's warplanes, find it necessary to fly in international airspace, which they have every right to do, but to do so with their transponders switched off, making them invisible? This is the equivalent of driving a large truck, a large black truck, through the streets of a city at night with the lights switched off. I do not see any political justification for this, and I'd like to know why it's happening and whether you have any plans to stop it. We had um, a well-developed system uh, of bilateral mechanisms uh, between uh, Russia and NATO. Uh, in the NATO-Russia Council, uh, military experts uh, were in daily contacts, uh, capitals uh, sent to the civilian experts. They had a number of uh, projects uh, to combat uh, terrorism, uh, to develop uh, special detectors uh, of explosives. Um, it was a joint uh, project. And uh, there was a, a project uh, to uh, train uh, personnel for the Afghan security forces, to equip the Afghans with helicopters. Another um, uh, project was the uh, um, Common Space Initiative. All those uh, projects have been put on ice, uh, though as part of uh, those uh, mechanisms, uh, we could agree uh, on uh, ways uh, uh, to avoid uh, dangerous uh, uh, military encounters. As uh, for the activity uh, of the Russian Air Force, uh, we have statistical data demonstrating uh, that the activity by NATO uh, has increased more uh, than Russia's did. Um, at the end of uh, January, our uh, point representative at NATO, Grushko, um, um, held a meeting with Jens uh, Stoltenberg to discuss uh, this topic, uh, and he submitted a fact sheet with uh, those statistical data. We've been keeping a record. We are open to restoring mechanisms of interaction, but as I said, all those mechanisms have been frozen. All we have uh, is um, a council of permanent representatives, um, ambassadors, that is to say, and it, it doesn't meet very frequently. Um, I understand uh, it is the objective of our NATO colleagues uh, to reduce Russian presence at NATO headquarters. 
uh, we've been facing limitations of access to our offices at NATO uh, headquarters. Um, uh, this uh, uh, will generate new dark spots in our relations and will prevent us uh, from clarifying each other's intention intentions.